Hi, my name is Eric Dumese. I'm working at Google. So I'm here to present um, basically what is busy polling, what has been done, and what should be done later. So first, first thanks. I want to thank everybody who worked on this since 2012. Uh, Jess Brandenburg that started your, the effort, and it took like five years to get to this point. So it was probably not that easy, right? So busy polling, what is that? So busy polling really uh, is the fact that uh, the current model uh, relies on interrupts. Uh, Linux started you know, with uniprocessor system 25 years ago. And at that time, uh, we really had to split the CPU cycles between application, kernel, networking, disk, whatever. So uh, this model has, has survived up to now. It's still used heavily. Uh, we rely on the fact that a device will generate an interrupt, and we have kind of complicated way to propagate this interrupt up to the application doing a read system call, right? So the idea of busy polling really is to try to shortcut some of the stage. So to recap this stage, uh, how it's done right now. You've, you have this in incoming network message, DMI from NIC to host memory, and then eventually the NIC will signal the interrupt to the host. And because of some various mitigation in place, uh, we don't want to signal one interrupt per packet because interrupt processing is kind of expensive. So Linux has this model of hard interrupt, software interrupt, and all kind of loops trying to batch a bit processing. So that's, we try to dequeue multiple packets instead of a single at a time, and thus for the receive, but also for a transmit. So we have this kind of uh, control loop where we don't want some batching, but not too much, because we, if we had too much batching, then you have extra latencies uh, if you interrupt like a uh, user application thread that expects some lower latencies, right? So in red here, that the two parts that might be quite long, actually. So that's a major source of the jitter on the system. So, and BusyPower try to remove these two red parts. So if I continue the, 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 the stack here, the Ultimately, the soft interrupt handler will call a NAPI pole, and the NAPI pole eventually will feed IP and TCP UDP stack with the incoming packet, and eventually wake up the application if the application is blocked on the receive call, or send the e pole in event to the select pole, e pole um, aware uh, loops. So why is this traditional? problematic. Uh, as I said earlier, this model was designed at the time we had a few CPUs, and we had to be really careful how we were splitting the CPU cycles between uh, the kernel and the user space. But nowadays, it's, this constraint is no, not really relevant anymore. We have a lot of cores, so I'm labeling this as a CPU because it's obviously a bit hard to tell what is a CPU? So that's exactly an hyper thread if you want. That's the CPU view you have in PROC CPU info. Okay? That's a unit of execution. Um, so maybe we could try something else. Uh, maybe we want to eventually dedicate some of this CPU to handle this one part of the stage of the pipeline, meaning that we don't really rely on interrupts and we don't care about interrupt mitigation. Um, so that's the busy polling um, first uh, hypothesis. So that's it. Not waiting for an interrupt and just remove uh, one source of the jitter and latencies. So that's a bit controversial because, yeah, uh, busy polling is actually burning cycles. So, yeah, it's a choice. Maybe it's not that a big deal if you have 100 CPU, 
and maybe if you burn cycles on the local CPU without uh, consuming any external resource on the bus, memory bus, uh, IO bus, maybe it's fine. Just maybe some watts of power. Yeah, that's a trade-off. So now the history. The history started in 2012 thanks to Jesse. Elise Determiner uh, submitted the patch in uh, Linux 3.11 in 2013. The patch set gave good results, but only for three NICs. The, that was IGBE, uh, Broadcom BNX 2X, and Linux 4. Um, and then uh, later, eventually, um, other drivers were added. So at that time, um, BusyPolling started adding a new NDO operation in every driver. And well, it made the whole adoption of BusyPolling quite slow because every driver, the vendor, had to add this support. So BusyPolling was tested for TCP and connected UTP sockets. And at that time, only the standard receive system call, poll and select were supported. Okay, so of course the first results were looking very great because uh, many NIC have crazy um, interrupt mitigation uh, parameters. Like on Melanox 4, we have 16 microsecond delay, basically. If you send one packet, then the NIC will signal interrupt after 16 microseconds. So if you do just uh, RPC between two hosts in the same rack, which, so two hosts which are really close together um, in terms of topology, the results are quite bad because with 16 microseconds added, you have like 17,000 uh, transactions per second without busy polling, and with busy polling, you get 63,000. So that's a huge, huge win. Okay, so for the API, we had two ways of enabling this logic uh, two syscontrol, which are basically not very useful unless you want to test that your driver supports properly busy polling because it's a global uh, syscontrol. So once you enable that, well, every application calling basically a receive on the socket will start busy polling. And so, well, yeah, that's, a, that's not very good unless you have a dedicated host. And then another one option was a socket option. Uh, but for various reasons, this option was limited to some um, capability, NetAdmin. So basically, if you are a random user, a Joe user on the system, you couldn't really use this uh, uh, socket option. Uh, so we will see later that maybe we can remove this limitation now on the current kernel because uh, we removed the limitation that we had uh, in the early days where the busy polling loop was done basically blocking everything else, uh, like interrupts, <laughs> bottom half and stuff like that. So in 4.5, we did this change. And basically, we allowed the, the busy polling loop to be a better citizen by uh, allowing bottom half handler to run at the same time. Uh, as you can see on the t-shirt, the, the results are twofold. Uh, we can service bottom half handler, so basically you can remove the extra latencies you had to pay at the very end of the busy pole loop. When you re-enable bottom half, we had to process a soft interrupt which were queued, like timers, RCU callbacks, all this stuff. So, uh, no more, it's, it's good, but it's also uh, add uh, support for tunnels. Like if you receive a packet, then this packet needs to be re-injected in the stack using native Rx. Uh, it will trigger a new soft interrupt. So basically, this uh, change allows a uh, tunnel to be supported by, by busy polling. And for example, on some driver, uh, uh, the transmit and the receive are using two NAPI uh, structures, so basically uh, this change al also allows the transmit completion to happen. So if you do the RPC, you send and receive packets, it's good to be able to process the transmit completion while you are waiting for the, for the answer of the RPC you just sent. Uh, so the second change was to try to get rid of the driver-specific change. 
uh, moving the busy polling logic in the core layer of the networking stack, you know, permitted to adopt busy polling on a lar larger scale without any change in the driver. Yeah, why? So that's the first thing. Try to allow more uh, reach for the busy polling, but also avoid some extra thing that we had to use on the driver because the busy polling uh, thread was competing with the normal nappy polling thread uh, reacting to it device interrupts. So if these two CPU would reach the nappy poll at the same time, it would be a bug. So we add uh, a lazy time here. I did this logic in the regular path. So every time the normal interrupt was going for non nappy polling user, we were paying the extra cost of do, uh, doing a spin lock. Later, changed by a compare and exchange, but it was still an atomic up in the fast path. So, more recently in 4.10, so the 4.10 one was last year, something maybe in October. Um, we did a small change uh, allowing UDP uh, for disabling for unconnected UDP socket. Basically, that's nice for a small system with a single NIC, with a single queue on a NIC. You don't really care because all UDP message will eventually come through a single NAPI port, even if uh, the socket is not connected. And then we did a small change in the NAPI Complete Done uh, API to allow a uh, driver to not rearm the interrupt um, in the busy polling loop, meaning that we reduce the traffic between the host and the NIC, uh, enabling, disabling, enabling, disabling interrupt all over again and again. So that's important for the future step of uh, busy polling. We will see that later. So more recently again, 4.11 finally got rid of all the NDO busy poll implementation in drivers. Um, so and you can see the performance slightly increased uh, from the early days. On Melanox 4, we get uh, 77,000 TCPR transaction. Uh, I think on Melanox 5, we are above 100,000 now. So. For the upcoming Linux 4.12, um, uh, Shridhar and Alexander added the ePoll support, finally. Uh, that's, that's very nice because, you know, modern applications use ePoll. They don't use Poll or blocking system call, of course. Um, so a new feature was added uh, to the socket API uh, so that an application could read a NAPI identifier so that it could eventually uh, classify the sockets after accept or after connect eventually to eventually split the sockets into multiple um, silo, if you will. A silo would be handled by one thread in the application and one thread would be running for every receive queue on the NIC. So if you have a NIC with a multi-queue like 16 queue, you could split your application, heavy load uh, application with 16 thread, and each thread would handle packets received on a single receive queue. And so BusyPoll makes sense here because uh, each thread would BusyPoll on each own queue without hurting the load on the other threads. Okay, so this is, there is one part missing. This is the EPPF part. Uh, basically, application doing uh, listen, system call, like let's say a HTTP server handling millions of connection. Uh, we, we, we need to do the classification before the accept. So at the time we receive a SYN packet, we want to flow this, steer this SYN to the proper listener. So we normally use SORU support for that. Let's say you have a 24 uh, listener, all bound to the same port, 80, 40, 43, for example. And so the SYN packet ultimately should be selecting the proper socket so that we can use busy polling for HTTP server. So it's not done yet because we need this uh, extra eBPF support. But that's uh, trivial. I'm pretty sure Daniel can cut that in a few minutes by the end of the day. Right? Where is he? Okay. <laughs> Perfect. 
Okay, so lessons learned. Um, LLS, you know, was very nice. The, so LLS name, of course, I mm, forgot to mention that was the initial name of the busy polling stuff, and then Linus complained loudly about that, and we changed that to busy poll. Um, so, because it, it was a prototype uh, giving good numbers, we did all this, and, uh, and after the driver implementer added their own stuff, and so we ended up with a lot of uh, stuff and bugs, by the way, in the drivers. So all this is gone. It took um, yeah, a few months. Uh, so now we can start to work some, on something else next generation because we don't anymore uh, change the driver. So it's much, much easier for the acceptance of the new, new stuff. So what's next? So all this <laughs> started from a single email sent on NetDev. I think it was in October last year. Zach Brown asked something very simple. If we could get away uh, programming a nappy in an infinite loop, basically not arming and disarming the interrupt anymore, just saying, I want to dedicate one CPU just to service this nappy. And this idea kind of is similar to one idea that Paolo Albini and Hannes had a few months before, I think it was in May last year, where they proposed a cast thread uh, to, to, to run the NAPI poll uh, logic. At that time, it was because of some interaction with, with, between cast soft interrupt daemon, soft interrupt daemon and user application on a single CPU system. But that's a bit the same idea. Of course, busy polling uh, next gen would rely on having multiple CPU because if you have a system with one CPU, there is no way you can use busy poll in the kernel and never give up the CPU because the user application won't have a chance, a chance to run. So that's a bit different. So it started from this email. Uh, so you could eventually, with the current kernel, do that, do this request by just coding some dummy application doing a receive system call, enabling first the busy polling logic and doing that in the loop. And never receive anything on this socket, like you take a random socket bound to an existing port. And, and by just doing that, you will, the thread will just read the, the device queue and service packets out and in. So yeah, it's doable, but I think we can do slightly better. Um, so, what's the, the problem here? Um, we try very hard to optimize networking. We had a lot of talks with, uh, in the past and last uh, NetDev and whatever, and we try to you know, shave some cycles by removing uh, the instruction what, what are not really needed, having specific camaloc or page allocator or what so, and cache. And that's very nice, but the thing is we have a huge deep pipeline uh, before you know, reaching the wire. So the application does a send message. We need to find out the file descriptor, the file structure, the socket. We enter the TCP stack, and there's a lot of stuff doing, going on. We enter the IP layer, the neighbor. We finally hit, hit a queue disk and do the unqueue. And then, uh, well, now we do it and have to dequeue this packet again and call the device uh, logic to send the packet. And, so we need all kind of logs, all kind of atomic operation, and then eventually reach the driver logic. So just you know, 10 gig driver now is a 10,000 line of code. It's uh, wow. So this endo start exmit is very complex code, and then uh, eventually when finally we send this packet, we, where we put it on the transmit ring, we roll back all this function all the way back to the user application. So that's a deep, deep pipeline. And all, the, all this is performed on a single CPU, the CPU running the application. And maybe the application don't want us to spend all this stuff in the kernel. Maybe the application would like to just to post this small message and continue its work in user space, um, keeping the CPU cache hot. And well, with this model, it doesn't work. And so this model doesn't work, and, and if we have a lot of CPU on the host, well, 
let's say 100 CPU, they will all do the, basically the same stuff, stuff, stuff. So all the 100 CPU cache will be loaded by this kernel code. Um, interesting, but maybe not very efficient. Uh, so we have this pathological case where we try to increase the number of transmit queue just to reduce the congestion on the queue disk clock and try to have this parallelism on all the CPU. The goal was, oh, each CPU should run with with that being slowed down by other. And by doing so, we actually <laughs> increase the slowdown because we have so many atomics and so many uh, cache flushing that we are arriving to this pathological case. You, you have experiments with 44 queues, so 44 CPU or 88. And if you increase the load on the number of TCP uh, sockets, you basically can consume maybe 30% of the CPU cycles just in the kernel to drive this 40 gig NIC. While normally, if you are alone, one single CPU can absolutely drive this 40 gig NIC very easily. So that's insane. Yeah, so why? Because the CPU cache are, are damn small. The L1 and L2 are very small. Just take a look at the various functions in the kernel. They don't even fit in that, so it's way too small. So the idea is to re-break break the pipe. So recognize there is a pipe and just implement part of the, st of the, of the pipeline in a, dedicate, uh, a dedicated CPU and a provisional CPU. Why it's interesting? Many, in many cases, the, when you share a server like or with 100 jobs, it's very convenient to be able to dedicate CPU to job. Say one job should be have three CPU, the other should be have should have four CPU. But then you also hit this problem of networking workload that basically could interrupt your CPU by just receiving a packet for another uh, application, and we don't account for that in the kernel. So that's that's a problem. So how we could do that? Um, we could just create a, a busy polling CPU group, um, preferably per numanode. Let's say you most systems now have two two sockets, two numanode. So in this model, we would create two, at least two CPU group with at least one CPU on this group. Um, we should have some way to add an other CPU and be able to schedule them or not, I meaning parking them in low power mode if the load is small enough. Most, most servers don't really lo uh, need a lot of networking load, so networking stuff, so probably one CPU would be enough. Uh, but for highly demanding uh, application, uh, we probably would need more CPU on these groups. So then after for the for the how to attach an API to the busy polling group, uh, we would require for each NAPI being, being visible in some way in CFS or something like that, so that the admin can say to the system, oh, I want this receive queue or this transmit queue on this NIC being handled by the busy polling CPU. Okay? So what happens in the NAPI and the receive path? Uh, well, in this mode, the busy polling CPU would drain the, the receive queue, the ring buffer, and would feed the packet to the IP TCP stack and put the packet in the receive queue, right? And that's it. Uh, if RFS, for example, a remote uh, receive flow steering is used, it could be used, then this busy polling uh, would stop at the moment we hit the RFS logic. So RFS basically queue this packet onto another CPU backlog and send an IPI. I would say busy polling is, is normally in the anti-RFS, meaning normally with this model we should not really need an RFS anymore, but uh, we'll see because we still have to implement that, right? So for the transmit path, um, I think that 
What would be useful here is would be to limit the first implementation of this busy polling loop on the um, lower part uh, from the Q disk DQ up to the device transmit logic. So that also includes all the BQL limit, all the transmit completion, uh, all this stuff. Uh, right now, the Q disk run uh, is a is an abomination issue, <laughs> and I'm surprised that nobody really complained about that because. Uh, right now, we do the QDisk and Q, and then we see if the current CPU can DQ the packet. And if yes, well, we <laughs> we can lock on this CPU on the loop on the QDisk run for hundreds of packets. So, like, if you have a real-time application you know, using SCADA FIFO, having very strict uh, latency uh, requirement, trapped on this loop, <laughs> it can spend hundreds of microseconds just servicing this. Uh, that's crazy. So in this model with the NAPI busy pole, you don't care anymore because you don't trap user application anymore. Only the busy polling CPU would do that, and so you don't have any more latency issue. Okay, so I'm almost done. Uh, I think we have some challenge here, but I, I think it's minor details. Uh, basically, this busy polling CPU would run inside the cat thread uh, so that we can easily uh, tune their prior or cl uh, scheduler class and all, all this stuff. Why, we also, why is that? We need to service soft interrupt. You know, uh, when we receive a packet, the TCP stack will eventually set up a timer, and this timer would eventually fire if we are unlucky, like a few seconds later, um, to do retransmit and stuff like that. So, and timers are using soft interrupt. Uh, RCU callbacks uh, to free the socket or all this stuff. And process uh, work queues because, you know, we use also work queues, work queues in, um, in the networking land. Um, yeah, that's about that. Um, I think I finish. So I would like to get some feedback from Intel guys because I know they are working also on this busy polling new stuff. Where's the Intel guy? All right. Oh, they're all sitting here. That's good. Let's start. Well, well, for starters, what kind of feedback is it you're looking for? Because I'm just uh, trying to absorb all this. So essentially, you're wanting to take the CPUs and, or essentially, you're wanting to bind the nappy polling to a specific set of CPUs and then have the busy poll just running consistently on that set of CPUs, if I understand this all correctly, right? Yeah. So for example, let's say you have a NUMA system uh, with two nodes. Uh, you split, uh, and normally uh, it's very often the case you have a single NIC. Right. So what you can do is splitting the queues on two parts of the new of the right. post. Yeah, so essentially you're creating a dedicated network processor on one of the cores. Yeah. And so Normally, uh, under a light load, one CPU should be enough to service all the queues you have. Let's say you have 16 queues for the worst right. case. The worst case being, you know, you are under attack, like a DDoS. Yep. You want to have 16 queues to be able to spread this to 16 CPU. Right. This is, this is the, how you provision your host. You just do a test. You test the syn flood attack with, let's say, 15 million packets per second, and you want your host to survive the attack. So you will yep. tune. Oh, to survive this kind of attack, I need 16 queues. Let's okay. I, don't, I don't know. That's a yeah. just a random yeah. number. So you split this in 8 plus 8. Yeah. But for a normal system not hitting this attack, one CPU should be enough. So you launch only one CPU right. on per CPU group. Well, so you're but talking you about also then having to reduce the number of queues then down to... And so the, the thing is you don't reduce the number of queues. Under attack, you just add a new CPU. And that's magical because you don't have to stop the, the NIC and reprogram it. So there's no disruption on the traffic. So you're talking about basically like changing the RSS or no? No, no, no change. The NIC will still steer the packet on multi queue per queue. So you don't need to have a single queue in the normal mode. Because if you do that, you have all kind of reorder issues and all right. stuff like that. Okay. So I think it's better to just leave the NIC as is because some NICs are damn slow to reprogram like two seconds, um, yeah. you know. Well, especially since a lot of the NICs still tend to do a reset if you start changing things like Qcount yeah. and such. So we, we already have all these RQ balance issues when just right. changing your RQ to 
CPU A to B is uh, disrupting, so <laughs> changing the number of queues on the NIC is, uh, wow, <laughs> it's yeah. no, 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 no go. Yeah, so basically, if you keep the number of queues uh, constant, then, and then in the high uh, stress mode, you could have one CPU per queue. So your right. CPU group, instead of having one busy polling CPU, would have eight. Um, hi, um, um, I didn't completely understand the TX path. Is it, um, my impression was that you kind of move XPS to the socket layer, so you, at send message time, you generate the hash and use it to identify the sending CPU. Is that correct? Oh, so this part is absolutely not part of the discussion. That's XPS, all this select queue logic. So I don't, I don't think it's orthogonal to the busy polling uh, stuff. Okay. The choice of the transmit queue is, uh, is not part of the, the talk, right? Okay. I, what happened here? <laughs> just, okay. uh, just because you mentioned it on one slide, that's why I wanted to ask. Yeah, so yeah, the, the, the choice of the transmit queue should be, yeah, it's outside of the scope. I, I mean, it's uh, the normal logic with all the anti out of order logic for TCP, you know, sticking on the queue if you have outstanding packet on the on the on the host. So this logic won't change. So my goal really here is to not change um, too many things in the kernel. Actually no change would be required on TCP IP layer at all. It would be only on you know, the net core dev dot C, uh, something, and the existing NAPI or uh, logic. Okay, thanks. And try to reuse code, not copy paste it. <laughs> Hi, Eric. Thanks uh, for the interesting presentation. The, um, the one thing that could happen is that all the NICs that support RSS can have dynamic changes made to their RSS indirection table. All of the, it's by the hardware spec. You have to be able to change the indirection table on the fly with no overhead, really. So you can just, you could literally, as you transition to this mode, you could just change the indirection table and direct it to one or two queues as you disabled interrupts. Without yeah. moving interrupts or changing CPUs or anything, you could just change the indirection table and instantly have all the traffic dedicated to one or two cores went, that went, went into polling. If you wanted this emergency kind of, or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, change in behavior at runtime. Yeah, but that would be probably NIC specific, right? Some, some NIC would be able to do that. Well, no, others. everybody that implements RSS spec can do this. Yeah, but, okay. <laughs> Which is almost all the NICs, right? Because mm -hmm. they want to pass Microsoft certification, so. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's not Microsoft, you know, talking here, but that's what drives a lot of the changes. Yeah. Hi, Eric. Um, so this is great work. Thank you. Um, one question, though. Um, on the RFS, I kind of found it interesting you would think this is the anti-RFS. Well, the rationale for RFS and RPS was that we wanted to specifically move the uh, layer 3, layer 4 processing off of the CPU doing the DQ from the NIC. One of the reasons we had to do that was because there could be a lot of variance um, in how much we have to do in layer three and layer four. For instance, what if somebody's dead IPsec or some levels of encapsulation? Mm -hmm. That variance, um, we had cases where it was like a millisecond blip. There was something in TCP. So actually I'm wondering, this seems like if we're going the other direction. So we went for multi-queue, we started, you know, even, even before all of this, we started with a single queue and everything was done on that. CPU, we ran that CPU to 100%. That was the maximum we can get out of networking on the system. Yeah. Uh, Multi-queue came along, RPS came along, and we said, oh, parallelism is a great thing. And then we kind of went berserk on multi-queue and said every, every CPU needs a queue because that's perfect parallelism. But as you pointed out, then that uh, kills nappy batching. Yeah. So going the other direction is great, but then it's, it sounds like we might get back into the state where we're trying to do too much on these key CPUs that, that are now busy polling, 
And if we're spending too much time or getting too much variance in the upper layer processing, that may kind of yeah, undermine right. the whole point. Yeah, so point. so I'm, I'm a little uh, wondering if RFS actually becomes a little more important in this context, in which case my question then is, um, is RFS adding overhead uh, because it's like IPI that we could al also solve by some form of busy pulling on RFS queues, mm -hmm. for instance? Yeah. So RFS really is, uh, you know, we, we, we on, on system with a lot of CPU, uh, you, you have this and a lot of the receive queue, you have this cross matrix between, between the, the producer and the consumer. And so we send IPI basically to a lot of CPU. And so in our experience, our RFS doesn't scale with a, a huge number of CPU. So for, to address your point, maybe the, the busy polling could be used, for example, for stuff like IPsec, whatever. You, we could have dedicated stage of the pipeline for for some step that we know are, are going to consume a lot of CPU. Let's say you need to, for example, do check some computation on the receive path because you only is not able to do that for uncaps, uncaps, yeah, whatever. You might have that. You could uh, also have uh, some logic for that. CPU only <laughs> dedicating uh, their cycle doing checksum, running a very small code, like this really check, check some, do, do check some, something like that. So why not? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I was just going to make the point that it, I think, think if I'm understanding this right, part of what you're going for is you're wanting to compress as much of the work onto a C, as few CPUs as possible so you get the most benefit out of uh, the cycles that you are using, essentially. So by, you know, it, in the case of the busy polling, if, you, if you're not doing anything, having all the CPUs in the system busy polling, you're just burning energy, essentially. So you want to have that one queue sitting there, you know, okay, I'm going to be yeah. only looking in this one queue for incoming packets instead of having all the CPUs spin. And so to some extent, that makes a lot more sense, especially if there's any way you can dynamically resize that, then that makes uh, the usability much better. So Yeah, because most of the benefit of busy polling really are, are in these two red parts. Uh, sure, having the last part here, the application busy polling on its own receive queue helps a bit because you don't have to schedule this thread, but we know that it's not going to scale with like 1,000 threads. So, and that's why the ePOL support was damn important because most modern applications use ePOL and each thread handles thousands of sockets. So ePOL really matters here. Okay, we'll send you to the penalty box. Sorry? So we're going to send you over there. People, you can come and talk to him. I know Hannes wanted to say something. Well, you, you, you look like you're about to jump at him or something. Okay. Uh, lunch location is finally... Sorry, go ahead. Just, uh, I want to say thank you, Joe, again for yeah. 